All good things come to an end eventually. For our stories, for our world, sooner or later, we have to turn the final page and say goodbye. So let's make sure people miss us when we're gone and don't go dancing on our graves. I'm author DC Ferguson, and this is the World Building Dojo. Before we go slamming into the brick wall and typing the end, we want to make sure our ending is coming at the right time. We want to be sure that it's the right kind of ending for the story we tell, and we want to know that it's satisfying to our intended audience. To this end, we need charts. You know I love them, so let's have at it. See, when we're discussing the end of a story, we know that doesn't start with when we type the end. It starts at the beginning of Act 3. In the classic three-act structure, this starts at the drop of the story, when our protagonist has reached their lowest point, so we have to set the stage for the final curtain. Now, this is a self-contained story. Here's how that structure looks in a multi-volume or serial story. You can apply this to, let's say, the Back to the Future trilogy. Or, wait, maybe it's Star Wars. Um, sorry, I meant Lord of the Rings. See, each one of the stories is a self-contained story with a clear three-act structure, but it also adds in this overarching narrative that our protagonists have to fix. So, each one of the self-contained stories has a beginning, middle, and end, but each one also serves a larger part of the three-act structure of the trilogy as a whole. This also happens in uh, miniseries, such as Netflix shows, or some of Stephen King's classic miniseries from the 90s, like uh, The Stand and It. Now, I won't lie, this is hard, but when you're looking at my last example here, I'm going all the way back to the 90s, because the technical know-how to pull this off is astounding. The writers knew exactly where, when, and how to stop each episode at exactly the one or two hour mark, and have you begging for the next installment. When it's done right, no one ever forgets you. So, if you want to be a legend, listen close and sharpen the pencils on this next bit. If we want an audience satisfied, there are a couple of reasons why this happens, and it's part of an exercise we're going to do. No, I really mean it. Like, seriously, pause this, go grab a notebook, you want to do this part. But DC, I need guidance. Don't you worry person that talks to their computer screen. The master of kung fu and friendship is the mama bird, always here to feed you. Tonight's menu, more charts. So here's our chart. I know, it looks really simple, doesn't it? Just wait. You'll see in a little bit where you go off the rails if you don't use it. Now, on the left, we have the key narrative plot points. Every major event in your story goes here, both for the main plot and the subplots. Notice that I already put some things in there for you? Yeah, that stuff needs to be there whether you like it or not, so it goes on every one of your lists. Now, right below that, we have overarching plot points. Now, if you're doing serial stories, the top and bottom are going to be the same, so you don't need to include it. But that top part is non-negotiable. Now, the right side, what do we have here? All it says is check. Ah, now you're getting it. DC, you tricked us. This is a damn checklist. Yes, it is, and you can't live without it. The biggest issue you're going to have in crafting a satisfying ending to your world is making sure that you've tied up the loose ends for the story you're telling, and the promise that you made will tie the loose ends of your overarching story later on. For a successful story, we want a resolution checkmarked in every single box of the top column by the end of the story. In the lower box, we want all the boxes checked by the final story in the serial. Now, watch what happens when we follow this checklist. See right here? Marty is introduced to the rules of time travel. Doc Brown is killed. Marty meets his father in the past and Biff. Marty commits to returning to the future and fixing the damage that's been done. We coast through the world laying out our plans. Marty gets thrown in a trunk derailing his plans. Marty's dad lays out Biff. Marty plays for the dance. Marty travels back to the future and saves Doc. Marty settles into the new world he's created and introduced to a new crisis. Now, I won't cover the whole trilogy here because this movie could have stood on its own without that last scene. But since they did do the trilogy, I'll touch on where it created the overarching plotline. So, in Back to the Future 2, like Empire Strikes Back, it's the low point of the series. It is directly because of that that most people find them to be the best ones. 
because we're following an overarching three-act structure that you only see the big picture for when you've viewed all episodes as a whole, you might not realize that they're always darker, more grim, and they end on a down note. That's the drop you're seeing. Did you realize that? If you did, you get a high five from the Master of Kung Fu and Friendship, if you can handle it. Now, at the end of Back to the Future 2, here's our drop. At the end of Back to the Future 3, the big lesson for Marty is that his future is no longer set in stone. He can be what he wants to be, and Doc should never have been screwing with it to begin with. As such, the DeLorean is destroyed, and Marty no longer is a slave to the timelines that he partook in, which puts the final nail in every loose end introduced from the very first film. DC, I'm still talking to my monitor, and I don't see where you can go wrong with that. Okay, fine, but if you're going to drag it out of me... So, here you have the Matrix. Again, with the damn Matrix. I know. I'm almost getting sick of using it, too. But, this is so important it deserved its own section. When you're making serials, trilogies, what have you, there is a tiny addendum to our wonderful checklist. See, we cross out rules, and we substitute that with recap. The recap period is where we briefly and concisely bring our audience back up to speed with where we left off and connect them to where we are now. That's because the rules of our world were previously established. We only need to remind the audience what those rules are. The Matrix Reloaded actually does this part very, very well. Within minutes, we're reintroduced to the Matrix, Neo, the rules, and his powers within the Matrix. The problems start cropping up at the end of the film, but to understand why, we need to look at the first one. In the real world, Neo finds out what it means to be the one outside the Matrix from Morpheus. Inside the Matrix, Neo finds out what it means to be the one inside the Matrix from the Oracle. What Neo is inside and outside the Matrix is part of the rules established in the first act of the film, as it should be. In the second film, Neo finds out that being the one is a planned byproduct of the Matrix itself, and his specialness is a glitch in the system that dooms everyone on the outside. And then on the outside of the Matrix, Neo uses his powers, which he only has in the Matrix, due to him being a glitch in the system. Now, ignoring the fact that those two things are completely contradictory, the problem becomes that we've now just made two new rules at the end of the second act of an overarching story. The rules of our world is at the top of the list in the very first story for a reason. It's handled there, set in stone, and does not change from then on. What The Matrix Reloaded did isn't just a faux pas, it's actually breaking the story, and one of the primary reasons that the final film fails so badly. What we're talking about here is commonly referred to as a retcon, and it's something you should never, ever, ever do. It's so bad that the only story to ever really get away with it is the Evil Dead trilogy. This series used an actual recap reel in the intro of the second and third movies that actually included scenes that weren't in the previous movie or outright contradicted the events. It was done on purpose for comedic effect, and it works exactly because of that. If you want to be taken seriously, you can't go retroactively changing the story and rules of your world. Otherwise, you get things like uh, midi-chlorians and whatever the hell this is. So we wrote down our checklist and we're trying to get through to our climax. How do we separate out the key plot points from the overarching ones? Well, we're going to get shameless here, but for a good reason. Speaking from personal experience, I wrote The Singer and the Charlatan with two main antagonists, Lord Robert Venegrass, the lovesick noble that's stalking Liana, and Weevil, uh, the deranged halfling that's trying to kill Priestess Trixie. Lord Venegrass becomes the primary antagonist in the first book, while Weevil's attacks are more of a nuisance. In The Princess and the Holy Juggernaut, those roles become reversed, with Weevil seeking to murder Trixie with the Holy Juggernaut, and Lord Venegrass is a bit of a background player. Now, in order to end the story presented in the first book, I had to tie up Lord Venegrass' story with a satisfying conclusion, while Weevil could be left to be set up as the primary problem in the next story. So, in this case, Lord Venegrass is a key plot point, while the tale of Weevil and his bloodthirst for Trixie is an overarching problem. Uh, again, Liano always wanted to play in the largest amphitheater in the world, and Trixie needs a flock of thousands to take on a pilgrimage across the world. Liana amasses a great crowd in book one, but the pilgrimage for Trixie isn't until book two. Key plot point, overarching plot point. You see what I mean? 
This is why we need to separate these things out. The key plot points all tie up nice and neat by the end of the third act in our story, while the overarching plot points are the ones that linger around until the third act of your entire series. There's a subtle difference between, let's say, Marty's hoverboard in Back to the Future 2 saving Doc in Back to the Future 3, and comparing that against, let's say, Marty's inability to back down from doing stupid things when being called a coward. The hoverboard is what you call a ripple effect in the story, where past experiences influence future outcomes, where Marty's psychological issues are a factor in the overarching plot of him growing up and maturing by the end of the third film. Pointing back to The Singer and the Charlatan, I mentioned Liana wanted to sing in the world's largest amphitheater. Without spoiling anything for that book, whether she succeeds at that or fails is going to have a ripple effect on the person she is at the start of the second book, even if the singing at the amphitheater isn't there or isn't a factor in the story anymore. So, as you can see, a lot of the takeaway from this is that determining your plot points in your story is highly dependent on knowing where they fit in the big picture. To that end, if you haven't done so already, I'd highly recommend going back to the Crafting Your Tale video to see how to do outlines and plot breakdowns. Once you've identified these plot points for what they are, you have to tie up the ones that come to conclusions in the final act before the climax. Doing so fulfills our promise from the start of the story and completes the arc the story was trying to tell. Failure to do this leaves meat on the bone, and audiences like a pile of clean bones. So here's the thing about cliffhangers. Never, and I repeat never, ever, ever do them. Unless you're writing the season finale of a TV show where it's kind of expected, even if it is a little bit antiquated, there is nothing that will make your audience hate you more than a cliffhanger. I could leave that comment to stand alone by itself, but let's briefly dig into the psychology in that. If you remember our old buddy's suspension of disbelief, then you also know that a big rule I talk about a lot here is how you never want to break that suspension of disbelief. That's because it takes the audience out of your world and out of your story. Cliffhangers do the exact same thing, but why is that? The reason might surprise you, but the answer is for the same reason you don't trust the snake oil salesman. These fast-talking guys will say anything to convince you to buy a bottle of their great stuff and all the reasons why you need it. A cliffhanger does the exact same thing. It shows you a world you can be invested in, tells the story it's trying to tell, but when the conclusion comes, the one loose end that's not tied up with a bow around it is the ending. Tune in again tomorrow at the same bad time, same bad channel. Your audience pops out of your world because they know you wrote the story this way. You did this to them on purpose to sell them more story, you evil, evil person. Quite honestly, if you're thinking about doing a cliffhanger, and again, don't ever do this, but if you are considering it, I would advise you as your sensei to consider that either your work isn't finished or worse, you don't have the confidence in your story being good enough that someone would want to continue in your world in the next volume. Both of those problems are really in your head. It's not the audience that needs to be scammed into it. It's more that you need to believe in yourself to bring everyone back for the next round. So believe in yourself. The more you know. Am I right? Closing out your tale, whether it just be for now or forever, can come with its own share of problems. Mapping it out and determining where you fit the pieces of the story can do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. Now. The Master of Kung Fu and Friendship is just getting over 400 subscribers, which is kind of a big deal for me, even if it is, you know, somewhat sad by YouTube standards. So I want to hear from you guys. What kind of things would you like to hear more about in future episodes? Don't be shy. Leave me a message in the comments. Also, check me out on the Art of the Arcane blog, and also don't forget that I have an awesome new series out. Links are in the description below. Help out the Master of Kung Fu and Friendship by hitting that like and subscribe button to hear about new videos. And as always, I am DC Ferguson. Now have fun and get crafting.